A vowed Roman Catholic nun, she has become one of the world's leading opponents of capital punishment. After having counseled and witnessed the execution of death row inmates, she told her story in the now classic book, Dead Man Walking. The book went on to become a hit film starring Susan Sarandon and Sean Penn, a stage play, and even an opera. And she went on to become the chairperson for the National Coalition to Abolish the Death Penalty. She continues to share her beliefs crisscrossing the globe as a much-in-demand speaker and continuing to write. Her second book, The Death of Innocence, focuses on wrongful executions. Hello, I'm Ernie Manus. Coming up on interviews, our conversation with author and activist, Sister Helen Prejean. ever be any crime heinous enough to deserve death? Maybe there are some crimes that are deserving of death, but the big moral question we have is who deserves to kill the person who did the crime? We've been engaged for 30 years in trying to make the death penalty work, supposedly for the worst of the worst murderers. We're not doing any better than anybody else when the government just says, basically, we can decide this. They set criteria. People really don't know what worst of the worst is because every time you kill a human being. So the pattern shows over the 30 years of practice boils down to, did you kill a white person? Where did you do it? In the locales where they're more prone to practice the death penalty. Um, and if if you're a person of color that kills a, a white person, that that ratchets it up considerably. And does the state have enough money in the coffers to pursue the ultimate penalty death? All those factors become the determining point. You talk about the uh, disproportionate amount of people who die in southern states in the death penalty. Why is that? That is, of course, close to my heart because I'm a Louisiana girl. I was just at Mercer University in Macon, Georgia, And Georgia's getting ready to execute yet another person. The 10 southern states that practiced slavery, the ones who lynched the most people, the extrajudicial lynchings, are the ones that do 80% of all the executions. Now, we got to figure that out. I mean, we're human beings with intelligence. We look for patterns. Why might that be? And just a study done even as recently as five years ago showed that where you have enough people of color in a state, enough to threaten the white population, the uh, penal system tends to be harsher and the punishment seems to be greater. So we have the track record of 30 years, though 35 states for the most part have had the death penalty on the books in the Northeast, less than 1% of all the executions took place. Now they have the same criteria, supposed to be for the worst of the worst and all this kind of stuff, but what, what is the disparity in practice? What can it mean? And what it means is because the Supreme Court gave a criteria that does not work, What does worst of the worst mean? For me, if my mother's killed, that's the worst of the worst. If my son, my daughter's killed, that's the worst of the worst. Any time a human being's killed. So when we go to apply the criteria, and prosecutors have huge discretion if they're going to go for murder one or not. And you look at the situation. Even if they run in for election that year can make a difference in how many death penalties they seek. So supposedly those scales of justice are hanging equally and it says equal justice under law. But you get into individuals, you get into their lives, you get into their biases, you get into their prejudices. And the pattern is so clear that when a white person is killed, generally there's far more outrage than the death of a kid of color. In New Orleans, 90% of all the homicides are black-on-black homicides, and it's barely, the death penalty is barely sought by the DA in New Orleans. Mm -hmm. So it finally is left up to individual people. And then the jurors, think of them. Because now we know we have a way to keep people safe because most states have true life without parole sentences. So we know that they're not going to get out again. We can be safe. So here go the jurors 
locked behind doors with on their hands, do I vote to kill this person or not? I know I can keep society safe, but is this, does the crime merit this death? And what gets in here too culturally is, do I owe it to the victim's family to give death? Because that's the argument that's often made. Look at this family and their suffering. If you could balance out justice, if you could make sure it was fairly applied across the board, would you feel that your work at least had moved in the right direction or do you need for satisfaction in what you do to see total abolishing of the death penalty? Two things. We will never see it fairly uh, done because it's human agents who from square one do it. The heart of it, though, the heart of the moral question, and this is in the dialogue I had with Pope John Paul about my Catholic faith and its stance on the death penalty, is that when I'm walking with an individual, granted who's guilty of a horrible crime that I I am abhorred by, and he's chained hand and foot, surrounded by guards, and he says to me, Sister, pray God holds up my legs as I make the walk. And I said to the Holy Father, I said, does the Catholic Church only uphold the dignity of innocent life? He's not innocent. But then he's rendered defenseless and he's strapped down and he's killed after he's waited 30 days, counting off the days, or maybe a last minute stay. This is not dignity of human life. That is why, essentially, the death penalty is wrong. It's against human rights and it's against the dignity of the person. Take me all the way back. When did you first know that you wanted to devote your life to, first of all, simply to God? Where did that come from? Yeah, simply to God. That's a great question. <laughs> simply to God. The way it was worded wasn't yeah, the no, way it's No, no, it's a wonderful question because that's what people say. Oh, here comes a God squad. Here comes a nun. You know, you give your life to God. Well, the God I was giving my life to or am giving my life to is through Jesus who told us to love one another and I was hungry and you... It, Christianity is very, very enfleshed. It's very incarnate. So the waking up to the more radical call of the gospel of Jesus, because I was a sweet, good little nun for years. I mean, I don't have anything against sweet, good people doing good things. I was a good teacher and all that. But justice, get involved with poor people in justice. But before you even get to that, what made you make the choice to be a nun? Because I wanted to give, from? I wanted to be, well, this is, may sound funny to you, but I wanted to be a free agent. And this is the way I put it. The sisters who taught us were wonderful and I wanted to be a teacher. And I just never could see myself pinning myself down to like one little man, one little family. And I wanted to learn and I wanted to pray and I wanted to be able to give my life uh, to others in a wider community, in a wider way. And that's why I chose the Sisters of St. Joseph, which I am. Then Vatican II happened. Then the wave really took off because we were cloistered from the world at first. I'm writing about this right now in my book. It's called River of Fire, Spiritual Journey to Death Row. So when I woke up about justice, that Jesus was on the side of the marginated ones, the ones who had no voice. Then, and when Vatican II happened, it plunged us. No one took Vatican II more seriously than the nuns, the American nuns. And so we began then to get into the world and saw the suffering of people. And that led me into the St. Thomas Housing Projects in New Orleans, where I lived side by side with African-American people my whole life. But now I'm going there to serve them and to learn from them. And I saw the other America. How did that change your faith at that moment? It changed everything about my faith. Still the same Jesus. But which Jesus are you going to follow? Jesus, the more conservative Jesus that says, well, the way you get God's blessing is if I make you rich. Richness is a sign of God's blessing. Or the Jesus who said, leave everything. Where's your treasure? Your treasure needs to be in heaven. Sell everything you have, give to the poor. Go and be with the poor and give your life there. That's the Jesus I finally caught on to. And I tell you, I never, I just came so alive in a whole new way. I don't mean a, a little sappy, oh, she's with the poor, isn't life great? Oh my goodness, I was seeing suffering like I'd never seen it before. I'd been protected. 
I wonder, though, when you see all that suffering, do you then question your faith? Do you sit there no, and it wonder does. Seeing why? suffering does not make me question God. It makes me look at us. God didn't cause them the suffering in the St. Thomas housing projects. Our policies are causing it. The way the public schools are run are causing it. The, the fact that every family has somebody in prison, just like every one of my friends was talking about what college they're going to. And that Jesus is always the crucified Jesus, the one who is hanging from the cross, who was executed as a criminal. His death happened because he identified with the marginated and the outsiders. And that, that is what happened to him. So to find Jesus in the world is always to look to where what's happening to poor people. And so truly, I came alive because it's the suffering that changes you. Because when you witness the suffering of people, you can't be neutral. Then you go even further. You start to correspond pen pale. Write the man. I never dreamed they were going to kill him. I didn't know anything. You never dreamed he was going to write you back. Well, yeah. No, that was the whole first thing. That's the first mistake that was made. First mistake was I wrote. Second mistake, he wrote me back. And there was this encounter. And through the letters, I found out he didn't have anybody to come see him. He never even asked me to come see him. He was just glad somebody had found him, was writing him letters. He had a connection. So he didn't ask me, but I knew. I said, I'll come see you sometime, and then I went to visit him. And that's the story in Dead Man Walking. It's a story in the opera. It's a story in the film. The opera actually begins with the crime. Patrick Sonier, as I'm going to find out, is sitting on death row because he and his brother did an unbelievably terrible murder of two teenage kids. And the opera opens with the crime. Everybody in the prologue of the opera is going to see innocent people killed. And everything's unleashed in the opera out of that. And that's what happened to me. I write him. I visit him. I see his humanness. He was always grateful that I came. Then I find out he and his brother killed these two kids. And I made a terrible mistake here. A really bad mistake. And it was that I didn't reach out to the victims' families. And it was cowardice. Pure cowardice. I thought they're going to be so mad at me. They're not going to want to see me. So it was a conscious effort not to reach out to them? It just wasn't an Well, no, I thought of reaching out to them. And then I pictured it. You know, imagination can do you mm-hmm. in. Because then I pictured, oh, yeah, I'm Sister Helen Prejean. I'm the spiritual advisor to the two people who killed your son, your daughter. And I just pictured them being furious. And, and, and so I just stayed away. I, it was unsureness. I had never done it before. You kind of sense you're not doing something right. I just didn't. The fear just kept me away, and I didn't plunge through it enough. And then when I met them, you know, it's for worst possible time because it was a board board hearing and it couldn't be more polarized. Right. We see all that play out. And the film, though, just so people understand, is in some ways a, a gathering up of other stories into one character that they create the year. But in the book, you visit different people. You've been yeah, it's through... two people in Dead Man Walking and two people on death row, different victims' families. In the book. First the lesson film. I had in filmmaking from Tim Robbins. We can never cover all the characters in a book. We have two hours to do a film. So Matthew Ponsolet's going to be a composite. We're going to have victims' families responding in different ways. And we're going to take people through the journey that way. They were very collaborative, by the way. We worked on every line and every scene of that film together. Take me back to the first time you met him in jail, in prison. Scary. Very scary. Here, and I I mean, no disrespect. A little nun coming in to the big house. You better believe it. What, and nuns don't get mind? any respect there either. See, in New Orleans, everybody in that cat is Catholic. You even could ride the buses free. And I walk into the Louisiana Penitentiary, and there's this big old green sign, you know, body scans, body cavities, dog sniffing. You know, and I was going, maybe they will cut me some slack knowing I'm a nun. And then I went, uh-uh. You can't play the nun card here. They don't give a hoot about nuns. And I was in a different terrain. I was out of my element, and it was very, very frightening. And then the guards kept bringing me. They kept slamming gates behind me, and they were yelling, woman on the tier. They actually got that in the opera, woman on the tier. And people were dropping back, and I'm walking through the hall, another gate, another gate, another gate. 
And then we rounded a corner, and there was a green metal door. It had a window with bars in it up at the top. And in red block letters, at the top of that door, it said, Death Row. I went, oh, my God, we're here. This is where they keep the people who are going to be killed by the state of Louisiana. I mean, the place, it traumatized me to be. And then they locked me in a room. Mm -hmm. You talk about ultimate security. So that also gives you a signal. This is a very dangerous place where you are. We have to protect you by locking you in. We'll go get your man. And then when I do hear Patrick coming with the guard, I hear the chains before I hear his voice. He was dragging these chains because they had leg irons on him. And ironically, that is one of the, the last things I remember when he walked to the electric chair was I looked down and there were those chains on his legs and it connected the two. So then, of course, I'm also afraid to meet him, the encounter, because you see all the images of people on death row are these are the worst of the worst people. And I begin to have doubts about all the nice letters. Anybody can write a nice letter. Hey, mm-hmm. sister, how you doing? Jesus loves you, sister Ellen, so do I. Then I'm going, but I got two hours with a murderer. What in the world am I going to talk about? My heart, you know, was going at an accelerated pace. And then the guard opened the door, put him into this booth, as big as a tele, uh, telephone booth, locked the door, and I looked at his great and I was shocked by his face because it was so human. I, I just never dreamed he could look human. I thought, you know, his jaw would be set or his eyes would look mean. And he was smiling and he said, thank you, sister, for coming to see me. And we began. One thing that makes your story different than a lot of stories we hear about people visiting people on death row is that you're not visiting with the idea they're innocent and you're going to free him. Right. You're there knowing that he did these horrific acts. How do you accept someone when you know they've done wrong? How do you get to the point, and you've definitely gone to the extreme in this area, what's the key? What do you do? <clears throat> the key is, the way I'm looking into your eyes now, I know you probably haven't murdered anybody. But even if you have, I know you're worth more than that one act or several acts of your life. There's a transcendence in us. Another name for it is a dignity in us. And when I looked into Patrick's face, it was a grace for me. I recognized it. Whatever he has done, he's worth more than that. Now, I don't have the horror of it yet, and I'm going to go through the horror of it when I meet the parents of the kids and these young teenagers that were killed. That's the essence right there. And see, what we try to do is we try to delineate out of all these different murders, 15,000 homicides, and say, oh, well, we're going to pick this one, this one, and this one. We'll call it the worst of the worst and kill them. Which, when you look at it in its baldness, what it is, we imitate them. We say they did something so terrible, we're going to kill them too. So all of this is a growth, of course, and an understanding as I, as I go. And I'm horrified when I find out what he does. And I talk to him very honestly about his own journey and accepting responsibility and being sorry and, and then facing God in this, in this last walk. And I watched as he responded and as he felt sorrow as now he's killed You know, often I've heard guards on death row say this. The man we're killing tonight is a different man from that rash, young, drugged kid with a gun that raped and killed. And see, the horror of the death penalty is we freeze frame a human being in the worst act of their life. And we don't believe in redemption. We say, you killed, so we got to kill you. And then we also tie it to, this is how you show honor to a victim's family. So what do you say to the victim's family? I know you've, you've built an organization that works with them, too. Yeah, but, but visiting with them is just, how are you? What's happening? How is your family? But aren't they looking at you as, you're the one supporting the person who did the well, worst wait, possible about thing whole, ever to But a family. whole journey that has preceded this. I don't pop up on their front porch and say, hey, how you doing? Okay, there's a whole journey in that. And that they have to want to see me too. Not all victims' families that I am the spiritual advisor to people on death row. There have been six. Most of them didn't want to see me. They couldn't, they couldn't make it. It was like the seesaw. She's on their side. She's with the enemy. Right. 
but then amazing people like Lloyd LeBlanc and Dead Man Walking, whose son was killed. And he taught me. He taught me. And then as we got to be friends, he shared the crunch of what forgiveness meant for him. He said, people think forgiveness means you're losing it. It's weakness, like you're condoning what they did. He said, condone it. Every day of my life, when I wake up, we lose David all over again. My wife nearly nearly went to a mental asylum from, from David. We had to move the house. We had to move from where he learned to walk. But he said, I tried to go there because everybody was saying, Lord, you got to be for the death penalty. you got to be. Or look like you didn't love David. Mm-hmm. He tried to go there and he said, but when I did, I didn't like the way it made me feel because it filled me with hate. Yeah, I want to see him dead. And then I f- thought, no, nah, they killed David, our son but I'm not going to let him kill me. And I'm going to choose to do what Jesus said because I'm a kind person and I love to help people. I didn't want to see that destroyed in me. So he was choosing life for himself. He's the first one, I think, that ever helped me understand that to forgive is really to relieve yourself of this great burden and not let hate take you over and change you. Preparing for this interview, I thought a lot about, you know, what would it be like if I were on death row and knew in four hours, three hours, two hours, I'm going to be put to death. And early in prepping for this, my thought would have been, I'd go insane. There'd be no way I could live knowing this. I would just lose it. Reading stuff you had written, I started to think, if I lived each moment for just the moment that it is, that I'd be able to get through it and it would be a release in some way. Yeah. Is that what happens with the inmates? It's an amazing thing. And I think hospice workers will tell you the same thing. Here's a person with terminal cancer, and you know they're moving into the last days, and they're made comfortable, so the pain isn't so in charge of them that they can't think. And just what you and I are doing now is what we did. We talked with each other. And he was helping to hold me up because I was scared out of my mind as we moved into those last hours. And Patrick had even said to me, Sister, you can't be there at the end. It was electrocution. He said, I don't want to see you scarred by this. You just pray God holds up my legs. And then I said, no, Patrick. I don't know what's going to happen to me. I've never been involved with anything like this before. But it was him. It was a connection with him. And we talked. We talked about God. We talked about forgiveness. We talked about his sorrow. We talked about how he caused pain to his mother. We talked about missed opportunities in his life when he had dropped out of school. We talked about that he drank too much. We talked about that he he couldn't be there for his kid, his child, that he had to leave behind. And we talked about how his mama made venison stew. We talked about how it was in the winter when he'd go out hunting and how they slept on the ground and just used a clot of dirt for a pillow. We talked about everything. It's all like free-flowing, but what it is, is the connection. It's the relationship. And if I let my mind go ahead to what was going to happen now in an hour, now in 40 minutes, I'd lose it. Mm -hmm. I had to stay rooted with him in the present. We prayed together. We talked together. And, and then time stops and it races by. It's when Susan Sarandon, when we were doing the film and she's doing this part of it, she said, this is the most surreal thing I've ever done. Time is surreal. It's all polite. It's following the protocol. People aren't mean to you. Hey, Sonia, you need some coffee? Hey, you need a cigarette? The psychiatrist comes, hey, you need a Valium? Take the edge off? People are being polite, but they're going to kill you. But what is going on, do you think, in the head of the inmate? Where are they, if this is the process you're going through, what are they doing to rationalize what's about to happen? Well, no. Well, I mean, you know, logic and and rationality only takes us so far. When you come up against the big abyss Mm -hmm. of the mysteries, like we're talking right now and I'm a step across that line and I'm in eternity, whatever that means, the connection, the human relationship is you're talking. And, of course, at times, Pat would lose it. At one point, he just dropped down to his knees and he said, Sister Helen, I'm going to die. And and I don't know what to do. I mean, I've never died before. It's it's just like I had put my hand on the screen and I said, Pat, look, God's with us. Christ is with us. You're going to have everything you need, everything I know about grace, everything I know about people 
having what they need to die. So I'm just, I'm blurting all that out. I'm just saying that and trying to reach into that recess of my own. And then I saw that he did have it. He did have it. He was very nervous. People can respond in different ways. Robert Lee Willie, the second one, he was the tough guy. He'd been an outlaw since he was... Diane gave him a high, a rush. He, he, he enjoyed the shrimp. He said, wow, you know, Diane, I, maybe he had never done anything big in his life before. I don't know what it is. But I went, oh, this is amazing, like Robert is. And he said, the electric chair don't bother me, man. And he gave a little bounce in his step as he walked to it. It put him in another realm completely. But Patrick, Patrick was so remorseful for these two beautiful kids that had been killed. Well, he's lucky to have had you. We're lucky to have had you and all the work that you do. We are out of time. Thank you so much for all that you've done. Thank you, Ernie. Great to talk to you. Sister Helen Prejean. To order a DVD of this or any episode of Interviews, please visit HoustonPBS.org.